Welcome, listeners, to today's episode of the Black Business Roundtable. I am your host, Doug Blackshear, broadcasting to you live from the city of diversity, Oakland, California. First off, I'd like to say welcome back, Dr. Ashley Coleman, as we missed you last week. Welcome back, sister. Thank you, Doug. I missed you all as well. Well, as you can tell, I'm already uh, calm and cool just knowing <laughs> that I got my ride or die host uh, sitting right next to me. So thank you. Thank you for showing up today. And I hope you took care of your business last week. Thank you. Today, we want to be sure to acknowledge is Cinco de Mayo, which means the 5th of May. So I want it to be sure we acknowledge this day on our show today. Furthermore, I care less about who leaked the Roe versus Wade opinion. Can you imagine that? The Roe versus Wade opinion. But more about that, what it means for any woman in this country, especially for those at an economic disadvantage and how they will be unable to afford travel to seek safe and necessary reproductive care. What about the children and women that experience that trauma of rape and incest? Dr. Ashley, we're going to be asking you to comment a little on that today. The psychological damage they're doing to these women who do not have the resources. What happens to them? Think about it. That when it means to your immediate family members, our daughters, sisters, wives, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, or cousins. Senator now VP Kamala Harris asked during hearings of Brett Kavanaugh, can you think of any law that gives the government the power to make decisions about the male body? I can't think of any. And what do you think the answer was? Because it is pretty simple, audience. I can answer it simply. None. And I'll say that again. Zero. None. Audience, register to vote in your midterm happening right now. And every one of them will make the difference and who is representing us all nationally or, or excuse me nationally our votes are all connected so i hear so many people saying well my vote don't count well my vote don't count well now you see what happens when you don't vote you really don't count our sisters don't count our mothers don't count mm. our aunties don't count so next time you decide not to vote you don't count thank you now, today's political corner, which reflects who is and is not locally or nationally honoring their commitment to work for their constituents. And Dr. Ashley, this is my this is my time to comment and rap and raid. So I'm glad you're back today. I don't know if you saw last week's show, but I was <laughs> I was pretty brutal. You can lighten it up. Audience, I had an opportunity. Um, we had the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee meeting last night. Uh, last week, I had put two proposals, uh, where I uh, presented two uh, legislations in front of our um, uh, committee, and one of them went through. That's uh, SB 1360, the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee has decided to take that up and that is tracking who is putting big dollars to support whom they must acknowledge why or excuse me where that money comes from such that people know who are funding these ads who are perpetuating these bad uh political decisions and legislation laws that and example we just spoke of one. 
your vote matters. Alameda County Democratic Central Committee, kudos to you. The other one that did not go through, and I found out because that was a Republican back uh, legislation, and that was SB 1367. And what that is, is uh, a no bid contract behested of the governor and other high officials. And what that means, audience, again, that the um, if you put money into a governor's or highly elected officials caucus, they can give you a bid without, or excuse me, they can you can be on a bidder's list where you are the only bidder. So when they need a job done, they call you. You do the job and you give them the bill, whatever you decide to give it to. Now, I can guarantee you, I can count on one finger, if not any fingers, how many black contractors are on that list. Now, to that end, we also had an opportunity to, um, last night, I had the Community Policing Advisory Board. Last weekend, we were at 60th Avenue at uh, Bancroft in Oakland, California, the Young's resident, Mr. and Mrs. Reginald and Sean Young. And audience, we had Deputy Chief Beer out there. We had uh, Chair Creighton Davis of the Community Police and Advisory Board, who has been a guest on this show. We also had Vice Chair uh, 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 Daniel Etlinger and uh, board member Donald Dawkey. We sat down with the deputy chief beer and I was thoroughly impressed. And if you live in Oakland, I want you to pass the word. Now, you know, I'm the first one that will beat up on the bad police. Deputy chief beer and his wife came to the pop up. We ate talked to the neighbors. He looked at the issues that were plaguing the uh, 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 quality of life in their community. It was an awesome time. We had a wonderful time. And that is what I call community policing, working with the community and the police hand in hand. Congratulations to Creighton Davis, Chair of the Community Police and Advisory Board for the City of Oakland. Thank you, Creighton Chair, for pushing to have the pop-ups in the neighborhoods in Oakland that have been devastated by crime, uh, a sideshow, a car burglary, it, and on and on and on. And I mean, let me backtrack on the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee. Now, I'm going to say this, and I don't even have to wear my glasses to see this. Democrats in the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee, we brought up a uh, position to where in the past two elections, in the Alameda County Board of Supervisors, David, I think it's Hobart, in District 1, who is a Republican. Now, I won't name names. But I will be in the future if you don't get your act together, Democrat. We have Democrats backing Republicans in the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. We have one Board of Supervisors who backed Mr. David Hobart, Supervisor, District 1. And he beat out Vinnie Bacon. And Vinnie Bacon has been a staunch advocate in the Democratic Party for equal justice, equal rights, and representation for the Democratic Party. Second, we have Sheriff Ahern, who is running for sheriff again. He is part of the police chief who is backing Terry Wiley. And police chief Ahern is a Republican. Terry Wiley you need to tell Chief Ahern that you refuse to take a Republican's uh, 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 hand of endorsement. That's wrong. Look what the Republicans did just a year ago on uh, January 6th. Storm the Capitol. And now we are 
getting endorsed by Republicans. I'm going to say this in conclusion. I have a lot of black men and women who are saying, you know what? Republican or Democrat, independent or Green Party, who's representing the black person? I'll drop the mic. I happen to be a constituent here in Oakland, California, and it appears that Mayor Libby Schaaf decided that I can no longer tag her direct Instagram account, which on Instagram is at Libby Schaaf. That is spelled L-I-B-B-Y. S-C-H-A-A-F. So if you two are having a problem tagging at Libby Shaft, I know use hashtag Libby Shaft. Please make it known and hit me up on Instagram at Art Blackshear and let me know because as long as we are letting a public official know the issue, we uh, issues why would you block one of your local constituents from tagging you directly? Now, let me say this, Mayor Libby, uh, Libby Schaff, cheerleader, graduate of 1981 of Skyline High School. If what I'm saying is so uncomfortable for you, I humbly ask that you come on to the show and talk to the audience and tell us what it is and what it what you are not doing to uh, improve Oakland in your last few months as mayor in the city of Oakland. Lord have mercy. Don't give me a heart attack. <laughs> I can't believe I got kicked. Now, you know, let me say this audience. An elected official is not supposed to uh, deny her constituents access to uh, being able to communicate with her. So we're going to follow up with this story. Especially, I am active in Oakland, including on the Oakland Community Policing Advisory Board and the East Bay Democratic Club. I will not, excuse me, I will let you know if at Libby Shaft unblocks me. Libby, whether you block me or not, I'm still going to talk. So unblock me here, good and bad, and take it like a politician should because that's what you're paid to do. That's what the tax dollars are here for, to pay for you to understand what's going on in our community and how it's affecting your constituents. Hey, Special thanks to our sponsor. Thank you, Dr. Doctors. Thank you, Mr. Donnie Glover of BlackUSA.News. And be sure to tune in to Chopping Friends on Monday, Party Marty, Let's Talk on Tuesday, Black USA Crypto News with Kamal Hubbard on Friday, as he knows all about blockchain and cryptocurrency. On Saturday, the blackout live from New York. My friend, my sister, my colleague, Tajmir, and Sunday, 60 Minutes in Black USA with Michael Haney, my brother from another mother. Thank you, Magnolia Engineering and Construction. Tammy Willard, is president and chief executive officer of Magnolia Engineering and Construction, one of the few black African-American female-owned and operated engineering and construction firms in the country and located in Oakland, California. Now, before I give you her website, I'm going to be brutally honest here, audience. They have many projects going on here in the city of Oakland. And some of them are by black developers. Now, if this hurts black developers, fix it. We get developers who are doing almost $200 million worth uh, of projects of development in Oakland, and they got white contractors, white general contractors 
And uh, one project does not have any black contractors that I've seen working on it. Shame on you. The disparity studies show 0.32% of dollars in zero construction money and the Department of Transportation money in the city of Oakland going to black businesses. And I hope our own people aren't a part of that. If you are and if you hear my voice and you're not, you have a, you're a black contractor, black developer, and you're not using black people on your project, I will be telling on you. So you might want to check yourself before I wreck yourself. Thank you. Magnolia Engineering and Construction, their website, and to learn more, Magnolia Engineer, Engineering and Construction.com. Because if our daughters can see her, they can be her. Thank you. To be considered a guest or to join our advertising family, send your company and or your name, address, website, company phone number, and social media page info to our email address. And that is BBRT2021 at hotmail.com for vetting consideration. Audience, today's show highlights, whoa, we're going to knock it off the park today. And I'm going to say this before I introduce and discuss. We are going to be introducing a new organization that has already started getting members from New York, New York, Tashmere's part of town, from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Donnie Glover, uh, who is the mastermind behind this podcast network, Tashmir Brown, who has been on the show several times, Chicago, be coming out with uh, 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 some of the past guests who've been on, who's also going to join this organization, Arkansas, Atlanta, Texas, Lord have mercy, unions, as Mr. Trent Willis, who will be a special guest on the show, has said, you better wake up and get on the right team. You better wake up because you are on the wrong team right now. Schools and labor against privatization. Slap is be on the show today. Try not to get slapped. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Tonight, we will discuss the combining for a common goal. This past week, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, and the Teachers Union, and the first day strike this past Friday, February, or excuse me, April 29th, 2022, of Oakland Schools. The combined effort started a new organization called, you like that one, huh? <laughs> you don't have to say it. That's what it's called, SLAP. <laughs> called SLAP, which stands for School and Labor Against Privatization. Help make this a most audience for teachers and labor unions to join together. Now, let me be clear here. Billionaires and multi-hundred millionaires and even some millionaires have almost destroyed the power of the union from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We need to get that back. And labor union officials, if you're not on SLAP's team, that means you're for billionaires and millionaires making all the money and your members hard-working teachers and administrators who are in the union and blue-collar labor and we have some white-collar labor shame on you look at where you are and back into reality i like that dr ashley <laughs> i'm gonna be sore i'm hitting myself pretty well <laughs> this has come about due to the planned school closures in the lower economic areas of Oakland and also the fight 
for Howard Terminal, Google Doug Blackshear and Trent Willis for our past show on Howard Terminal. We also want to thank you, our audience, for your thoughts, prayers, messages, and donations to Carlton. Now, give me 30 seconds for Mr. Carlton. This was a young, educated, college degree, young black man who had his own business, who was threatened by a disgruntled employee with the AR-15. He was going to the car to get his AR-15 and the man was protecting himself. Carlton, on the Black Business Roundtable, we got your back. They gave this young man life in prison with no possibility of parole. We humbly ask that you donate, whether it be change or paper, but we have to fight against unjust that has been put on this young man. They just had, what, uh, four or five months ago where a young man was walking, a white young man was walking through the streets with an AR-15 and shot white people demonstrating against police uh, 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 problems, mayhem, and he got off free. And from what I understand, he's running for Congress disgusting only in america i also want to thank you our audience for staying for the money that have been donated the ongoing efforts to raise the twenty thousand dollars to hire the legal defense firm needed to get call carlton justice in 2022 so once again audience we need your help it's time that we stop putting our black and brown men in jail for situations where if they were white, if they were white under the same circumstances, they would have never gotten life imprisonment in prison and no possibility of parole for defending his business his and his patrons. Thank you, audience. Moving on, our guests today include our, and I, I had to work on that, Dr. Ashley, <laughs> our weekly check-in with our very own Dr. Ashley Coleman, doctor of psychology and newly tenured and immediate past department chair, assistant professor of psychology at University of the West. Dr. Ashley, welcome back. Thank you, Doug. Trent Willis. Whoo, hey, that name sounds familiar. <laughs> Immediate past president of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU Local 10. Janani Ramachandran, Esquire, will return later this month. She is running for District 4 in Oakland, California. Her new website is Janani, and that's F O R 4, Janani 4, Oakland.com. And her new Instagram at Janani, and that's the numeral four, Oakland. Now for the national political highlights and several elections. Georgia early voting started May 2nd. And primary is May 24th. Now, before I mention my brother from another mother, we have put some Instagram uh, uh, shots for Mr. Marcus Flowers that will rock your world. We have one called, well, you got to see it. Go on my Instagram at Art Blackshear. And we took a theme out of Chef. <laughs> Who the man? Chef, <laughs> you got to see it, Dr. Ashley. Marcus Flowers, our guest, February 24th, 2022, Democrat running to defeat Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene in Georgia's 14th district. He believes in bipartisanship and building and bridge building and does not 
believe in vilifying political opponents. Learn more on Instagram at Marcus4, and that's the numeral for Georgia, or his website at Marcus, and that's F O R 4, Marcus4, Georgia.com. His yard signs are ready. Help knock on doors and phone banking. Visit his website for details. Hashtag one Georgia. And that one is spelled out O N E Georgia. One Georgia. And the other hashtag is. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I knocked over my camera. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. Let me get it back. <laughs> Dr. Ashley, I had to start laughing. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready for this? <laughs> I'm sorry, audience. Hashtag perjury Taylor Green. <laughs> Once again, Marcus Flower. Other hashtag is perjury Taylor Green. Now, briefly, Google perjury Taylor Green, and you will see why I'm laughing. That woman got up on the stand, and she she lied so much she she could have just laid on the on the on the floor and just been a rug. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, I had to get that out there. Audience, uh, Senate Senator Reverend Raphael Warner, a Democrat, helped flip Georgia blue along with Senator John Ossoff, running for Senate to fight for affordable health care, protecting voter rights, and ensure the dignity of working people and a more house college alumni. Learn more on Instagram at Raphael Warnock or his website at warnockforgeorgia.com and at Warnock F O R Georgia.com. Hashtag One Georgia. And that's O N E Georgia. One Georgia. Stacey Abrams, a Democrat. Economic, educational, and social mobility. Healthcare, military family, and veteran support are all a part of her policy platform. To quote Stacey Abrams, opportunity for our state should not, and I repeat, should not be determined by zip code, background, or access to power. Learn more on Instagram at Stacey Abrams or visit her website, StaceyAbrams.com. And her hashtag is One Georgia, and that's O N E Georgia, one Georgia. And my sister down in Florida, who's tearing it up against little Marco Rubio, and get ready, I got my little Marco Rubio skit ready. Val Demi, a Democrat, is running for the 2022 Florida Senate seat. Text the word JOIN to 77076. Once again, that's 77076. 076. Her policy platform includes national security, jobs, and economy, health care, housing, and environment. Vote to unseat Republican little Marco Rubio in Florida. Little Marco, pack your little bag, put your little kid Mark tennis shoes on, and scurry on up out of there as our ex-president once said, who is possibly facing some indictment charges himself, Donald Trump. Val tag line is never tired. And I want to repeat that. Val's tag line is never tired. Learn more on Instagram at Val Deming or her um website valdemings.com dr ashley i've been waiting to say this for now two weeks now and now 
for the news of the day. And Dr. Ashley, I tried to give the EJI like you would do it, mm -hmm. but I couldn't even come close, my sister. So you might have to double down today. <laughs> and now for our news of the day, Dr. Ashley, please take it away. Thank you and welcome back, my sister. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, good evening to all of our listeners. Again, the news of the day is courtesy of the Equal Justice Initiative. And so on May 5th, 1943, the topic is to prevent interracial marriage, California requires that marriage licenses indicate race. And what's really interesting about this, Doug, is that some friends and I were talking about the Bay Area um, and the history of integration of interracial marriage um, and again, culture. And so it's so interesting that this is coming up now. So again, on May 5th, 1943, a new law went into effect in California requiring that all marriages, marriage licenses indicate the race of the parties to be married. This law passed unanimously by the all white, all male state legislature was, and it was designed to help the state enforce its existing ban on interracial marriage. As California law declared at that time, quote, no license may be issued authorizing the marriage of a white person with a Negro, mulatto, uh, Mongolian, or member of the Malay race. Any interracial couple who defied the statute or any clerk who provided a marriage license to an interracial couple faced a fine of up to $10,000 or up to a decade in prison. Wow. So continuing on, uh, though many northern states repealed their anti misintegration laws before or soon after the Civil War, many southern and western states responded to the emancipation of millions of enslaved Black people by strengthening their bans. Fears of a weakened racial hierarchy were especially intense in the South, where the bulk of newly free, uh, freed Black Americans resided, and where white people had long feared that ending slavery would be the first step to total social equity and unrestricted sex across racial lines. Similarly, many Western states feared that the end of the Civil War would bring an influx of emancipated Black people and lawmakers saw bans on interracial marriage as one way to reinforce the racial order. So California had banned interracial marriage between white and Black people since first achieving statehood in 1850. And under a law passed that year, all marriages of whites with Negroes or mulattoes are declared to be null and void. California later, later expanded the law to also ban white people from marrying people defined as Mongolian or Malay in response to a subsequent increase in immigration from Asia. The state's white community widely supported the enactment of these policies and the officials who passed them. The California Supreme Court struck down both the 1943 statute requiring race on ma uh, marriage licenses and the state's much older ban on interracial marriage on October 1st, 1948, in the case of Perez versus Sharp. Nearly 20 years later, on June 12th, 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously decided the Loving versus Virginia case declaring bans on interracial unconstitutional, um, excuse me, declaring bans on interracial marriage as unconstitutional and striking down such laws in the 16 total states that still had them. And so again, just such an important part of history. Also thinking about um, the racial diversity in California, also considering the great migration that happened from the South, um, from free slaves and, and descendants thereof. And so it's just interesting for all of us to kind of track our family history, migration, and see how that law and racial marriage impacted um, those of us who've been in California for generations. Dr. Ashley, even when you explain and articulate tragic times in the history of this country, you stated such that is soothing and we can embrace it without, and me personally, without getting angry. Because to hear that story is, is disgraceful and America, America needs to move forward. So thank you, Dr. Ashley. Thank you. And once again, oh, 
Um, is our guest backstage master of ceremonies uh, behind the scenes? I know she's supposed to come on at four thirty-six. Ah, oh, there she is, Dr. Ashley. We're going to break in. Um, oh, wait, a minute, hold on. Special bulletin, special bulletin <laughs> from the Black Business Roundtable. Alisa Victory, running <laughs> for mayor of the city of Oakland, has stepped into the office. Uh, can we get a special update? Uh, uh, candidate running for mayor of the city of Oakland. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Happy May. Hope y'all had a great April. I'm glad to be back to chat with you for a little bit. Um, as you may know, I'm actually having a campaign event tonight at Zanzi, located in downtown Oakland. We're having a really special guest all the way from D.C. who is a national civil rights leader, youth justice leader, has been campaigning around the country to relieve student debt as a racial justice issue, also advocating for climate justice as a racial justice issue. Uh, Wisdom Cole is our host tonight. You all can join us 5.30 p.m. Zanzi at 19 Grand Ave. But the campaign is going well. We are focused on getting out the vote, talking to voters, talking with small businesses, and with the real workers and residents of this community. We're going to decide the November 8th election. But happy um, to hear if there's any specific questions. We've started getting into debates. We just had a candidate debate um, with students in schools and labor against privatization. Their acronym is SLAP. Um, on Saturday. And so you can watch it on YouTube. It was recorded. Um, several of us candidates attended, but there are also candidates for Alameda County School Board and for Supervisor, which is going to be on the June ballot. Uh, Alisa, I, you know I'm like a little kid when I'm around all these beautiful, intelligent, articulate sisters, which you are one. Let me be clear here, audience. Slap is getting ready to do a 503 and go coast to coast. We've had, and I mentioned this at the early part of the show, and I'd like for you to speak a bit about it. Alisa, since you were out there on the front line, since you were interviewed by SLAP, and I wasn't interviewed with you in the candidate forum. Now, can you give our audience what your perspective is on SLAP briefly and once you get elected, how you will work with SLAP. Thank you. Thank you for the question. SLAP is a coalition, a historic coalition of labor, as well as schools, families, students, and teachers. It's union members, but also residents and families, those who are directly impacted by proposed school closures from our public school district those who are impacted by the proposed Howard Terminal Project to work at our Port of Oakland, and those who are in solidarity, including myself. This came out of organizing, of the power of people talking to each other, organizing with each other, using each other's wisdom and knowledge about what is happening, how this is a historical issue that was happening even when I was growing up and attended Berkeley Public Schools because my mother was a teacher teaching in Oakland and knew that our school system was in crisis decades ago. And so this is a long-standing issue and we have to pull together our elders, people who've been through this fight and folks who are new to our city, who are new to the issue and make sure that we're educating and bringing people in. And so I was interviewed um, as part of Labor Notes, um, labor videos that follows a lot of different labor movements and labor actions at a community action. It was a planning meeting that was held at an elementary school in East Oakland with parents and teachers and students. And it was an organizing meeting to talk about what can we do? What are people doing that is working? What are people learning from these fights that are happening, not just in Oakland, but in Hayward and in other school districts across our state. And so I've been on the ground organizing with these community members, with these residents, with our workers. And that's why this coalition is important to me, it was important for me to attend their candidate forum that they held and they're a big stakeholder and constituent in this election. And I'll continue to show up to work with our workers, with our students and our families. Uh, Dr. Ashley, you say I have to get back used to sharing. You were gone last week and all I can do is, is so before I, you shoot off a question, if you have one, Dr. Ashley, audience, let me be clear here today. I've asked 
all the candidates come on to the show. And I've called them. So Oakland candidates running for mayor, and you see me backing and talking well about this candidate because the Black Business Roundtable is going to play a huge role. A huge role to make sure that the candidates that have the uh, wits, the intelligence to come on to this show and talk to not only our audience here in Oakland, Alameda County, and the state of California, but all across this nation. And if you don't want to come on this show, why? You must be scared that I'm going to ask you those tough questions because we are not selling Oakland out anymore. And we have, was it, 10 to 15 candidates running for mayor? Who filed in 10 paperwork so far. Filed in 10. Well, let me just be clear. Candidates running for mayor of Oakland, if you choose to ignore Doug Blackshear, Dr. Ashley Coleman, and the Black Business Roundtable, then we'll continue to promote whoever does come on the show because we ask the tough question. And one of those questions I'd like to ask you is this, Elisa. As you can see, a lot of being asked out of our teacher. Dr. Ashley's mother and father was a teacher. So I'm sure you'll have a follow-up question when I ask this, Dr. Ashley. If you are elected, what will you do to improve our teacher relationship with the administration who's making six figures a year, but we want to, like we do in our contracting, Mayor Lobby, oh, excuse me, Mayor Libby Shaw, do you want to give crumbs to the teacher and expect everything out of them? And second part of that question is our labor, our union labor. And Trent Willis said it excellent last week. You union labor leader, you're on the wrong side. You remember that, Alisa? You yes. are on the wrong side. So can you address those two questions? And once again, audience, I've asked, and I'll continue to ask, and I'm going to start sending emails to the candidates who are running for mayor of the city of Oakland. If you are afraid to come on the show, what are you afraid of? <laughs> Don't worry, it doesn't bite y'all. But thank you for this platform, for inviting me to speak on it and just for the important topics that you cover. I mean, just what you were sharing when I came on about kind of the history of really harmful and racist policy in the state of California. Those are important conversations to continue having and to spread. Uh, to your questions, the first one about what I'll do to protect or to support teachers, it will have to be more an allyship role because I don't control the school board. I won't be at the negotiating end at that table, but on the city's end, I will be with city workers. The city and the school board, school district are separate entities, but workers have a right to strike and they've been demonized for doing just that on International Workers Day in coalition with our teachers and our families and students. And so there has to be really strong city level protections, including a local version of the PRO Act the right to unionize, but also the right to engage in strikes and an actual Department of Workplace and Employment Standards that helps to enforce that. As y'all may have been following in the news that our Oakland Education Association had to go through our Public Employee Relations Board, our National Labor Relations Board, trying to fight and get administrative support for their right and to declaration that the administration on the other side of the school board was not holding up their end of the bargain. And so I am a union attorney, I am a union member, and I do support workers' rights. Again, from the city side, I will be on the opposite side negotiating with workers. But I would absolutely advocate to the school board, to the school administration, to support our essential workers. Teachers are essential. They never stopped working during the pandemic. They help ensure that our next generation is prepared, is successful, is supported. Our teachers are seeing front lines what is going on with our families. Our schools have been used as spaces of public resources, of recreation, of providing food distribution to families. Our schools are integral to our society and our community that we have here in Oakland that we're trying to grow and improve. And so we don't need to be cutting 
teachers cutting their salaries, cutting their benefits. We don't need to be demonizing their right to unionize and have strong labor representation at the table. And so I support what our union has done in recent weeks. I support their teacher strike. I support May Day. I support our workers. Um, to your second question, Tower Terminal Projects, the Port of Oakland, there are workers and labor on both sides of it. And I'm clear of that and it's confusing a lot of folks in the public who are not sure which side is the labor position because labor is not necessarily united on this issue. And I see actual a racial disparity and kind of what union members, what types of jobs are going to be most impacted and affected. I'm clear that my family currently works at the Coliseum. They are seasonal workers who work at A's Games. They live in DP Oakland. I've lived in DP Oakland as well as every district of this city. I want us to have development, but it has to be equitable. My position is never going to be on the side of a private corporation or supporting a billionaire's proposal just to support it. It's always going to be on the side of the community. I was clear that I worked on the community benefits agreement that was sponsored by our city of Oakland that included members of ILWU port workers, West Oakland residents, as well as East Oakland residents. And we came up with a robust matrix that my understanding, none of our city is really negotiating from that position. Why would they sponsor this months long process and have a really detailed matrix, a roadmap of what community benefits would look like for this project, but also can be applied to other large projects that may come up or are currently pending in our city in other districts. Why would they go through that process to then not hold that as the city's position and be accountable to all of the community members and all of the workers and constituents that were involved in that? So I'm clear that I will not agree to the project as proposed with its current environmental impacts, its racial impacts, its jobs impacts, because there is not community benefits to offset that on the terms that the community has set forth. And so I Stand with workers. I am a union member. I'll come out to your actions and your rallies at a family tragedy and wasn't able to actually join the teacher strike on 29th, but did publicize it. Again, I've had members from SLAP and other groups organizing in our city come to my campaign events to educate people. And if this goes to a public vote, it's important that people are educated, that people have spaces to discuss it, to talk about it, to hear from all stakeholders, not just what narrative certain people in our city may be pushing right now. And again, there is money that is involved because this is a billionaire who owns this team who would be profiting off of this new development who gets profits from the current AS franchise. And so money is always going to be involved, but I am not a money candidate. I'm not a corporate can, I'm a corporate free candidate. And so I'm focused on what is going to best serve the residents and workers of our community. It's still going to be a long process. We're still going to be in relationship with the A's at our current Coliseum with their lease that's in place till 2024 and them wanting to purchase part of the property to develop it. So again, my position on any development is going to be the community. What benefits, what protections, what mitigations are necessary? And I have higher standards than what CEQA and our other laws require. Dr. Ashley? I have so many things. Well, first of all, welcome back. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you for taking us up on our offer to, to share your platform. And there's so many things I want to pick your brain about, but I'm going to keep it light because I do know uh, that you have a bit this evening. So this is a, um, a side pitch, but I hear that after you and Wisdom Cole do your speaking that there's salsa. And so I want to hear a little bit about Oakland being arts. What's your artistic background? I mean... If I could have been an artist as my career, I would be. <laughs> uh, I grew up on the arts and culture here in Oakland. Um, it, that was my recreation. My mom put me in any arts camp she could find. I've done dance, I've done ceramics, I've done stained glass, painting class. I made my own paper at Studio One Art Center in North Oakland. So I would you know, join different recreation centers, after school programs, YMCA programs, any type of summer camps and after school that was, you know, providing my mom some support as a single parent, but also was always really focused on arts and dance and just the culture and vibrancy we have here in Oakland. Um, I also went to Berkeley High School and I'm a proud alum, even though I was living in Oakland the whole time. 
but one of the unique classes I was able to take to replace my PE. PE was terrible for me. A lot of students didn't enjoy it, just running around the track or just doing push-ups for an hour. Um, and so I was able to take Afro-Haitian dance with Mama Dieu, who teaches at community colleges and a lot of other educational programs throughout the entire Bay Area. She's even been to some commercials, she's kind of big time now, but just being able to engage in like dance and cultural practice and learn from her, learn a different type of education style altogether and have that count towards my mandatory high school credits was just really transformational for me. And so I've always loved art. I looked like a five-year-old when I try to draw. So I didn't really pursue that as a career, but it still is a really important piece of my life actually right now in just my own mental self-care balance with work being able to do art. I do a lot of painting. I also do graffiti stenciling. I do a lot of art on this campaign. So we have a lot of artists that are supporting us, who are helping us with our designs, with projection art on our buildings around the city. And so artists are helping to move us forward. And I think that arts and culture reach a lot more people than politics. Like people may pay attention to politics around election season, or if there's some huge scandal going on, but rest of the year, you know, they're focused on themselves. So if they have a friend or they want to hear music that they really like, or they want to go out dancing, right? Those are spaces where people are going to always be at, regardless of the season. And so I think using art as a tool to help bring people into this campaign is important for me. And one of the, one of the grassroots strategies of how we're running this campaign. We also have a strong arts platform of investing in our arts and cultural districts and small businesses like Zanzi. Yes. I just want to follow up just by saying I appreciate your artistic background and I'm going to date myself and going back to the days of festival at the lake. I know there's 510 day at the lake, but I participated in a dance troupe and it was transformational. And so I appreciate your attention to that as we start keep brainstorming how we can we create optimism for our youth mental health outlets um, and just thinking of the ways to just celebrate what makes Oakland beautiful and one of those things is is our artistic abilities that set us apart so thank you i thought that was really cool i said salsa okay absolutely now oakland has first fridays every first okay. friday of the month come and join us at grand and telegraph at 6 30 but it's also called oakland art walk because it's featuring so many different types of art oakland artists there's even several art galleries that will have exhibits open during the event nice uh Alisa, I know you are running because you have a, um, yes, uh, got run, yeah. in a few minutes, but we want to thank you from the Black Business Roundtable. And audience, let me be perfectly clear. I will reach out to every candidate, but it appears that there's only one candidate who has a plan who was willing to come on to this show that airs from Oakland, California to New York City from Canada to Mexico and in several other countries to share her plan to make a better city for the constituents, for the residents, for the citizens, for the businesses, and for the union people in Oakland, California. Alisa Victory, you are always welcome on this show. And for, the, for you candidates who choose to avoid me, keep running. You're going to run your way right back on to where you were before you were running for mayor. Elisa Victory, good luck. We'll see you soon. Dr. Ashley, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. You can visit victoryforoakland.com to follow me, contact me, connect with me as we reach victory in November. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. I look forward to more discussion, longer discussion with you all. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, uh, Alisa. Alisa Victory, candidate for the mayor of Oakland. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Ashley, please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. And a big thank you to Mr. Donnie Glover of BlackUSA.News. Listeners, be sure to tune into Chappin' Friends on Mondays, Party Marty Let's Talk on Tuesdays, Black USA Crypto News with Kamal Hubbard on Fridays, and he knows a lot about blockchain and cryptocurrency. And on Saturdays, we have the Blackout 
from live from New York with Ms. Tashmir and on Sundays, 60 Minutes in Black USA with Michael Haney. Again, a special acknowledgement to our first sponsor, Magnolia Engineering and Construction. Magnolia is unique, offering engineering and construction services and a comprehensive administrative and compliance component. And to be considered a guest or to join our advertisement family, please send us an email and close with your company details to bbrt2021 at hotmail.com for vetting consideration. Doug? See, that's why I need you, girl. I was flipping <laughs> last week. I'm back. <laughs> there were banana peels all over the place. <laughs> teamwork. Dr. Oh, teamwork makes a dream work. And audience, let me be clear. Dr. Ashley and I have never worked together, but this was a match made in heaven. Yes, it so, is. Dr. Ashley, I would like for you to give our Therapeutic Thursday for our audience who missed you last week. Uh, Mr. Trent Willis is scheduled to come on at 5, but we're going to skip um, one of the um, uh, sponsorships because audience, as I've said numerous times, just as you would have a broken leg, just as you would have a cavity and have to go see a dentist, a broken leg, to have to go see a medical doctor. When you have a splinter in your brain, go see a doctor of psychology. Dr. Ashley, please. Therapeutic Thursday, take it away. I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you, Doug. And greeting listeners, uh, welcome to May. We've acknowledged Cinco de Mayo. It's also Mental Health Awareness Month. And I am I really am excited to talk to you this evening, but I have to give you a trigger warning. I'm talking about a subject that is minimized in the Black community. Um, and we talk about mental health, but what we don't talk about is suicide risk. And this week alone, we've had several public suicide completions from individuals in the black community. Now we talk about business, we talk about reaching our full potential, but our youth and our adults are achieving, but they're also silently suffering. And um, for many of us across the African diaspora, not to exclude um, our other listeners, but it's really important to understand that suicide has been viewed largely as a sin and as a, a forbidden word, but that silence again is killing us. And so what I wanna do is invite all of you um, to participate in this conversation, first by scanning just how do you feel just by me saying the word suicide, because again, it's usually whispered. I'm bringing this to your attention for our older viewers as this week, um, a young lady, um, actually a Southern University student, Arlana Janelle Miller, may she rest in peace, posted a suicide note on social media, um, apologizing to her friends and to her family prior to taking her life. Now there is a snippet of this suicide letter that I do want to read. Um, I wanna honor her words. But I also want to, again, not judge, but to highlight areas where we're, we may be missing each other. And again, it's important to ask the questions. Um, family, we know you care about grades. I'm, for those of you who are watching, I have on my Howard alumni t-shirt as Howard University will be having their commencement um, you know, events this weekend, always Mother's Day weekend. And so we understand it's important for us to care about the business, the productivity, but also the whole person. And as I read this, I also want us to hold space and thoughts um, for Miss Miller's family. Uh, May this day bring me rest and peace. I have fought the, this urge since my early teenage years. I gave this life all the fight I had. To everyone who has entered my life, I'm so grateful and I can only imagine how this may find you. 
I have been surrounded by people who have, who may have honestly thought that I was okay, but I haven't been okay for a while. I struggled so much through just this year alone from COVID to physical injury, to nearly failing all of my classes, to the people in my life, I pray you learn to vocalize your feelings and get help always. I failed at that and I'm afraid it's too late. Mom, thank you so much. I pray you know I'm at rest now and you would have given anything to see me happy. You have given everything to see me happy. I've written so many suicide notes in my life, but finally I've reached my end. I hope this teaches everyone to check on your quote, strong friends, be present always. I may be contradicting myself, but never give up. I know that I'm letting a lot of people down by what I'm about to do, but I've lost my connection and I blame no one for this and I'm sorry. And that's a snippet. And what I want to bring to attention first is the scan of how that feels to hear. It's heavy. Um, we're still in a pandemic. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what's opening up. We have spent two years in isolation. There have been people lost. There have been freedoms lost. Um, this stress has increased the cost of living has inflated. And when we think about hope, uh, for some people, this is the first crisis that they're experiencing. And when you're young and what you wanna do is make people proud, you can put weight on external factors and things that are temporary. And so when I read this as the story, um, and there's been outpouring outcries of people that loved her, who cared about her, that just wish they would have known. Um, this motivates me to keep talking about the warning signs when someone is struggling. Um, I, again, we had the former uh, Miss USA. Her mother was on a major news network this week reading the last text message that she received from her daughter before her daughter ended her life. And again we just need to talk and ask questions when people are going through but often it's our own anxiety where we don't want to ask the questions because we may not really be ready to hear that answer we do have a suicide hotline we do have mental health professionals that are available that can handle this i know again that i'm used to saying the word suicide because i'm trained um, but i've had to ask people that in my personal life and have those conversations so are you feeling hopeless Right. We, we know the cliches. Oh, you're going to get through this. Oh, just pray about it. You can have God, a therapist and medication. You don't have to choose. You can have all of it. But it's about coming along someone and asking them. Are you feeling hopeless? Are you having any worries that you're not going to get through this? I won't judge you. Are you having thoughts of wanting to harm yourself or not wake up? Um, again, people are afraid or, or people around you giving things away. Have they lost? I know we're all distracted and overwhelmed. There's Roe versus Wade. There's this, there's that. There's our personal life. But pain is real and there can be a lot of shame and admitting um, that you're having thoughts that maybe you're better off not being around. And we have to listen. We have to ask these questions. And oftentimes too, for family members, I know you love your relative that may be sad or depressed, but responding angrily when someone is suicidal or why would you think that? You know, we love you. Why would you do that to us? That Those are statements that are meant well, but will shut down the conversation. We want people to be open. We want people to be honest. We want people to be encouraged to receive help. Um, in addition to these sisters that I've listed, also those of you, many of you know, I've worked with student athletes and we've had five collegiate athletes, very public suicide completions. And the families have been courageous in being very open and honest about how their child died. Again, per statistics, 
Black people are in the minority for suicide attempt and completion. That's going up and it's starting earlier. What's really happening in our community is that when our relatives die by suicide, we don't tell anybody. Right? So we pass on this shame and we're actually inadvertently saying to people, this is a part of mental health that needs to be addressed. And so I wanted to honor Miss Arlana um, even in even in death, impending death, she was pleading for other people to listen and to get help. And so again, there's therapy for black girls, therapy for black men. We'll put that across the screen again. There's also the lifeline. There's also a crisis text line. You can text 741-741. Uh, 24 7 365 if you don't want to talk to someone live on the phone you can walk into your nearest emergency room tell someone you are loved depression is a liar you are worthy pain is temporary but there are people that are trained to walk in those dark spaces with you but this is mental health awareness month and you know we care about all the wonderful accolades, the diplomas, but it's you. It starts with you and it's in you, not on you. Okay. And so we can't care about anything that you contribute to society without caring about you first. And also just another, um, <sighs> suggestion is when is the last time you've affirmed someone not for their productivity, uh, just sharing what they mean to you. What you care, what you like about them. Um, in paying attention to the internal factors. When's the last time you complimented yourself? We're so hard on ourselves when we're striving for the goals. And we can have this perfectionistic mindset or this idea of contingent work. I'll celebrate myself when I get the house. I'll celebrate myself when I make that six figures. I'll celebrate myself when I get that contract. I'll celebrate myself when I meet the one. I'll celebrate. And, and it's just constantly, when we meet the goal, then it's up here. Then we, we, we And it's never really just being. Have you celebrated for just yourself for just being? Because you're worthy. You are worthy. You're valuable. You're loved. And if you don't hear that from someone else, get in the mirror and tell yourself that. Affirm yourself. You may not always have a fan club. People may not always be around, but you will have the longest relationship with you. Please work on it this month. Thank you, family. Dr. Ash, we're over about eight minutes, but let me tell you something, audience. The information that she just gave you, my colleague, my friend, and my sister can save your life or the life of a friend or loved one you know. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Thank you, Doc. Glad you're back on the show. Thank you. Audience, we're going to immediately, immediately get into, let's welcome back Mr. Trent Willis, immediate past president of the ILWU Longshore and Warehouse Union Local 10. Dr. Ashley, can you please read his bio? Absolutely. So Mr. Willis has been a guest on our show several times since the inception of the Black Business Roundtable podcast um, starting in May 2021, <clears throat> coming up on that year. And last week he was on the show uh, due to the joining of two unions for a common goal, Union Strong, ILWU, Local 10, and the Teachers Union. The common causes of education that has been an effect on our children, the closing of Oakland schools, and also the Howard Terminal. Audience, we encourage you to join SLAP. Uh, the turnout on Friday was in the thousands. It was on the news. And boy, did parents, teachers, labor leaders, and community members combine their individual activism into the start of a movement. They turned up and they turned it out. And the organization, again, is on Instagram. Their handle is at slap.bayarea. 
as well as their website, slapbayarea.org. And the organization is looking to turn this into a national platform for all unions, teachers, and parents. While we prepare to get Mr. Trent Willis out here, audience, I am backing this organization 199 point up. Wait a minute, he's coming in and out. I am backing schools and labor. Oh, there he is, the slap man. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Trent Willis. How are you, sir? I saw you last week with those ILWU people, the school teachers. And let me tell you, I was inspired. When my dad, well, he was a teamster uh, uh, back in the seven, 60s and 70s and 80s. But to that end, sir, please tell our audience all about SLAP. And let me be clear, audience, Mr. Willis is not, Trent is not a, uh, 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 um, he's a friend of the show. And we want to make sure that our audience from the East Coast to the West Coast, from Mexico border to Canada border. Join SLAP today because they're putting together a 503, pro, uh, 503 uh, organization. Mr. Willis, Trent, take it away. How you doing? Can you can you hear me? Mm-hmm. All right, well, well, once again, it's, it's good to see you. I want to uh, send a shout out to your audience. And, and uh, once again, thank you for uh, allowing this platform on, on your show. Uh, it's is very much appreciated um, by not only SLAP, but the, the ILW Local 10 and the, you know, the ILW Local 10 family. So we really, really appreciate the platform. Um, yeah, uh, SLAP uh, stands for uh, Schools and Labor Against uh, Privatization. And I, I talked about it a little bit when I was on your show um, the last time um, we were uh, in the middle of uh, uh, planning uh, a, a huge event uh, on April 29th uh, that, uh, that went off really well. Uh, we had a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of participation. Um, for those uh, in your audience that don't know what, what we're about, we're, we're, we basically got together, uh, started from the, the uh, OEA school teachers, Oakland uh, Education Association, and the ILW Local 10 um, started this organization to fight against uh, privatization that's affecting both of our unions. Um, one, I talked about the proposed uh, stadium deal uh, here in Oakland at Howard Terminal uh, that the ILWU uh, is, is absolutely opposing. And, and, and I also talked about uh, the school closure plans in Oakland uh, that the OEA and the Oakland teachers uh, are they're they're opposing those school closures and the privatizing of of the schools in Oakland? Uh, the unique thing about it is it just happens to be the same uh, billionaire family, you know that that we're fighting against. You you have the the Fisher family, who is the the owners of the Oakland A's, um, are the driving force um, uh, to uh, purchase and privatize Portland. And they're also the the uh, the owners of uh, KIPP, which is the uh, charter school organization that is looking to take over the schools in Oakland uh, once they're closed. Uh, take take not only take over the schools but privatize them and 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 take over the land that those schools are on. So we're we're trying to get people to focus in uh, um, not only just that, but the fact that this is something that's happening all across the country uh, with uh, billionaires and corporations making a run on, on public resources, um, which is the most important thing. Uh, public resources are, are absolutely meant for the public, uh, mostly the, the, our you know, disadvantaged uh, community members, citizens, and people who, who badly need public resources. You know, the, the last time I checked, uh, Billionaires are not in need of public assistance or welfare or, or any type of uh, uh, public resource like that. And, and 
of billionaires don't need access to public land to make a living um, and to to uh, earn a salary and that kind of thing. So we started this organization uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, that being the main reason to stop privatization. We also started the organization to fight against bureaucracy um, in uh, within and out uh, of the labor movement meaning that we plan to get fully involved in, in uh, local uh, and national uh, politics when it comes to organizing for, for voter drives and, and, and organizing voters uh, to uh, support uh, progressive tickets um, that we establish ourselves, you know, because we understand that, uh, that organizing in our own name in these days and times is absolutely necessary. Uh, when we're dealing with the the republicans and the democrats uh who have uh, uh without a doubt allowed uh billionaires and corporations to infiltrate the political system in a way where the working man and woman is 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 always competing with billionaires uh, money corporations money and the the only thing we have to compete with that is is our labor which the SLAP organization understands that, that the labor is worth a lot more than the money um, because the, it's the labor that creates the money for the corporations and billionaires. So we got to start using that power. We, we understand that. So we're going to start organizing in that in that arena and also within the labor movement uh, to put pressure on this these so-called labor leaders who uh, are constantly uh, rubbing shoulders with big business, uh, we call them business unionists, rubbing shoulders with politicians and not uh, uh, really paying attention to the rank and file members on the on the ground um, that they're supposed to serve. So it's actually the same uh, the same problem is, is being felt by working people within the labor movement that that is being felt outside of the labor movement when it comes to representation. Um, so we are organizing in our own name, uh, uh, organizing under the banner of working, the working class, which includes the unionized and uh, ununionized, uh, the unemployed, uh, every person uh, who is not a billionaire <laughs> or is not uh, uh, part of the, uh, well, I guess the 1% is a working class individual. And once the people in the United States realize that how powerful the working class can be, if they stick together without allowing all of the, the uh, interruptions and distractions um, and things that divide us, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to make movements very quickly organized and moving at uh, all at the same time. You know what? I have so many questions to ask you, Mr. Trent Willett. You are a friend of the show. Mm -hmm. Now, today, and Dr. Ashley, give me a couple of questions because I've been dying to ask <laughs> the guru of Howard Terminal, ILWU, and the mastermind who helped put the SLAP organization together. I have people all across this country. Trent, I've had my sister in New York telling her about what you're doing, and she saw the videos on my Facebook page, Instagram, and uh, LinkedIn. She, got, she has people who are ready to pay dues right now to join in Baltimore, Tamara Brown, in... Uh, 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 Baltimore, Donnie Glover, in Chicago, Lita, in uh, Arkansas, uh, 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 Mr. Harris, in Atlanta. I mean, you you got a thousand members and you guys haven't even organized. <laughs> yeah, so, audience, I want you to pay attention. It's time that, like Mr. Willis has just said, that Trent just said, without your labor, you can't have a billionaire. Is that fair to say, Mr. Uh, uh, Trent? Well, you can still have a billionaire. I mean, you can still have corporations. Um, but what what you won't have 
if we're organized in our own name is you won't have uh, um, oppression <laughs> and you won't have uh, working people being taken advantage of. You won't have, uh, um, you know, billionaires making a run on public resources. You won't have unsafe working environments. You won't, you won't have uh, uh, workers basically being exploited. Now we're, we're living in times where it seems to be uh, an uprising um, in this country when it comes to working people. <laughs> you see examples of it uh, all over the country. Um, two examples that come to mind right now is you have the you have the Starbucks workers um, in New York, which which you know made many headlines you know across the country. Of, of those workers would be the first uh, warehouse in New York uh, to to organize. Uh, as you know, Amazon is a huge company. Um, there's a, a triple dipple billionaire <laughs> that runs that company. I mean, I, mean, I, I think well, last I heard, he was the richest person. Uh, in this country, if not the world, you know, um, and then you have the Starbucks workers mm -hmm. who are uh, beginning to organize uh, coffee shops, you know, all across the country. Um, you even have the, uh, uh, I don't know which nurses union is, is going on strike um, here soon um, to fight for better wages and, and, and to, you, you know, in particular, the nurses, I, I want to say, uh, who we absolutely support. Um, I mean, the, the way the nurses have been treated uh, during the pandemic and since the pandemic shows, uh, gives you a picture of how uh, much the working uh, stiff in this country is respected. You know, when you go to other countries like France, um, that uh, have representation through a workers' labor party. Um, you can see how the influence on uh, elections, you know, can steer the direction a country's going in. In other words, uh, you you some of the things that are done here, uh, some of the uh, uh, misrepresentation and uh, just flat out. You know what? What can I? What can I call it? I, you know, I'm, I'm looking for the worst word I can possibly find. You know, but the the disenfranchisement of of the, of the working class here in this country would not be stood for in France. Um, you you've often seen on the news where the workers in France they shut the whole country down. You know, depending on uh, uh, you know what what's on the table and what's being discussed. You know, so the working uh, a person in France is united with the next working person, you know, in France, you know, and, and that's what's needed here. You know, uh, the working people can basically not only uh, control uh, the scenario through their work hours, but they also have a lot to say when it comes to politics and when it comes to issues, you know, like Roe versus Wade right now. You know, you have, uh, if you look at Facebook, you'll see that there are a lot of working people on Facebook right now discussing Roe versus Wade. They're discussing it. Just just think of, uh, of all of those people discussing, get together and say, okay, well, let's do something. Then you got to, you have an impact. You have, then you start getting the ear of the elected representative. You got to apply that pressure, the same pressure that corporations and billionaires are applying with money. The other direction, we have to apply that same pressure with our labor in the opposite direction. Okay. And and the, the, the power of labor is always going to win out over money. Um, Dr. Ash, let me ask this man one important question before you get your question out, which is, I sit on the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee alternate delegate for Pamela Price. Audience, for those of you who don't know, Pamela Price is running against uh, somebody who's being endorsed by a Republican, Mayor Ahern, or excuse me, Sheriff Ahern, who has teamed up with the police chief across the Bay Area, who's supporting, supporting 
a Republican is supporting a black district attorney candidate. That is outrageous. But to that end, as I sat last night on the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee and listened to some of the, uh, and you know, uh, you are affiliated, well, excuse me, you're not affiliated with this. The Alameda County Labor, is that association or committee? You're talking about the Alameda Labor Council? The Alameda uh, Labor, uh, what was said again? So that our audience can hear this. The Alameda Labor Council. The Alameda or Alameda Labor Council. Alameda it, County Labor Council. Audience, what Trent just said. <laughs> can you tell our audience why that ILWU is not affiliated with the what you just said. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, well, that's that's a pretty long and complicated answer. I, I can just I can sum it up. We we were um, um, extremely involved with the labor councils. What happened is, and I can't remember what year this was. Um, a few years back, um, we decided our our um, our leadership on the international level um, decided to that we would disaffiliate with the AFL-CIO, which is the national uh, institution um, that that uh, you know represents uh, workers all across the country. The labor councils are subsidiaries of the AFL-CIO. So once um, we disaffiliated with the AFL-CIO on a national level due to some type of dispute that you know our international president had with the with uh, Richard Trumka, uh, who was no longer there, um, then the local labor councils, uh, in particular here in the Bay Area, started to put us off of the labor councils. <laughs> which to me didn't really make any sense. You know, I don't see why we couldn't still be affiliates of the labor councils here locally. Um, but they used the fact that we were disaffiliated with the AFL-CIO and they started to remove the ILWU from the labor councils. And we, we've been on the outside looking in ever since, even though we still have a lot of, uh, of support and we still have a lot of unions uh, that still work with us and you know organize with us uh, uh, we're we're not officially uh you know on the labor councils here in the bay area if that answers the question uh i got a lot more questions but dr ashley please fire well question two off because i i got a dynamite question coming up uh <laughs> Go ahead, please. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Trent. I want to um, acknowledge one of our viewers, Bleacher Dave. So thank you for watching. And I'll start my questions off with actually posing uh, his. Can you share with us what is SLAP's plan to provide community benefits for West Oakland? SLAP's plans to provide community benefits? Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to understand that question because SLAP's purpose is to organize the working class um, against, uh, you know, exploitation. Um, you know, just to give you a short answer, um, community benefits in regards to what? Like, you know, I know we talked about community benefits that the uh, that the Oakland A's were supposed to provide for uh, the construction of the stadium and and that kind of thing. Um, I, I believe the benefit for the community uh, would be that uh, they'll, they'll be organized in an in a organization that will give them power to have a voice um, and to have some control over, over city and county, uh, even nationwide politics. Um, we, we hope to organize to the point where we're running our own candidates. Um, you know, and I talked about this earlier, uh, where where you know, the, the working class in this country doesn't have a represented party um, for a progressive labor friendly candidates to run for offices. Um, within the labor movement, we have, uh, you know, we have access to 
uh, running for and holding offices within the labor movement that influence uh, either the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, but that's still on the outside looking in. Um, we've experienced uh, for too long now not being heard. You know, that's why the, the national uh, living wage is, is still as low as it is. Um, when inflation is soaring, gas prices are soaring, uh, billionaires and corporations are, are making more money than they ever have in the history of this country. The wealth gap is wider uh, than it's ever been uh, in the history of this country. And every time in history that the wealth gap has, has started to widen like it has now, there has been some type of response from the working class. Mm -hmm. And this is a spark um, for that, that rise. It, it, it's, it's starting to happen without SLAP, but you know, SLAP is gonna be a part of uh, the workers' re re you know, revolution um, in this country, the big take back is what I call it. Mm. Brown would like that, big take back. I like that, I like that too. Uh, so, you know, I know you've discussed this before, but we really want you to make it plain. So why are the schools trying to uh, be shut down by the Oakland School Board of Education as they've recently, um, they voted recently to close 11 public schools? Which students will be adversely impacted the most? Okay, well, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter which which area we're talking about. We just have to be talking about the, the Oakland schools right now. But in every instance where this type of gentrification is taking place, it always affects the black and brown communities the hardest. It affects the black and brown communities first. And, and, and it's, it's basically a displacement, you know, of poor people um, is what it is. And you, you have uh, uh, you know, uh, people who want access to those resources. So the public school resources in these neighborhoods are for the, the poor and disadvantaged kids in those neighborhoods. It's, it's not for uh, a billionaire's enrichment or it's not for the purpose of a school to be replaced with a private school that the poor kids um, and families don't have access to. Um, one of the the uh, false rumors you'll hear going around is they'll say they'll compare Oakland to other cities um, like Stockton and Santa Clara, where they say, well, these areas only got uh, uh, 40 public schools to service all of these students, whereas Oakland has 80 public schools. And it's very difficult to provide funding and uh, upkeep for these 80 schools. So since it's so hard to, to, to fund these schools and, and keep them going, their uh, idea is to close them and privatize them and let somebody else run the schools. Well, what they don't tell you is that the population in Stockton, California is 230 something thousand people. Okay, the, the population in Santa Clara is, I believe, close to 200,000, if even less, uh, um, you know, citizens that live in Santa Clara. Okay, the population in Oakland, California is close to 500,000 people. Okay, so Oakland is double the size. It's, it's probably the size of Stockton and Santa Clara put together. Okay, so that's why you need double the amount of schools so that uh, all of the citizens in that live in Oakland have access to schools. Okay, with, with the plans that, uh, that you know, we're hearing about from Oakland, if those plans go through, you'll have students that have to travel miles to go to school. You know, they won't be able to go to school in the, in the, in the school in their neighborhood. Now look at what this does though, because, and I'm just gonna bring up one aspect of it. When you look at the gas prices right now, Mm -hmm. Okay, this is just one area where you you might have a, a single parent uh, living in a neighborhood in Oakland right now that has a school right down the street or across the street, 
that their kid could access and go and get an education. Say that school's closed. And then that parent who was already disadvantaged, who is already struggling, has to then drive that child all the way across town every day with gas prices at $6 a gallon. So it's a it's an added burden put on the already poor and disadvantaged disenfranchised people in the community. And that's that's not what elected officials are supposed to do. They're not supposed to further burden you. They're supposed to make uh, to do things to represent the people that put them in office and make their lives easier. You don't we don't put people in office to make our lives harder and to make our lives more expensive and to make it harder for us to 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 raise our families you know so this uh what i call back turning attitude towards the poor and disadvantaged has to stop it's, it's not what our system was built to do our system was built to uh, uh for people to have access to the american dream some people need help gaining access to the American dream. And that's what public resources are for. So that the poor and disadvantaged people in our communities have the same access to the American dream as, as uh, people who are well off. And uh, it, it's, it's just not happening, you know, and, and, that, and that's not just isolated here to here in the Bay Area and in Oakland. That's happening all across the country. You know, that, that's why the wealth gap is so much wider than it's ever been in history now. Yeah. And the working class has to stand up, unite together, start getting rid of these politicians who are who are smooching and rubbing shoulders with, with billionaires and corporations, and taking in all that money. We got to uh, uh, get rid of these labor leaders who are joining the crew. I call it the Klan and and um, and helping to pave the way for these uh, uh, corporations and billionaires to take advantage of working people. You have to get rid of them. I mean, we have to replace them with people who will go in and tell uh, billionaires, hey, you know, I represent the working class. I represent the people. So I'm going to, you know, make decisions that benefit the people. I can't make a decision that benefits you as one person when I got 400,000 people that, that are counting on us to, to make the right decisions. So that's pretty much it in a, in a nut simplified in a nutshell. No, thank you, Trent. I have a few more questions, but want to go back to acknowledge another one of our viewers. Thank you, uh, boss. Uh, Dixon for tuning in. Trent, what is the ILW's plan if on June 30th of the BC, uh, BCDC meeting votes to remove Howard Terminal from port priority use? Well, uh, uh, the ILW's plan is going to be continue to organize and, and, and fight back against that. That's going to always be our plan. We're never going to give up fighting against um, the, the private you know, privatizing of the docks. Um, that's our livelihood. That's that's all we got. You know, it's, it's, it's not like there's another port in Oakland somewhere else. You know, there's a, the, the port is there. Um, your audience has to understand that what's being planned at the Howard Terminal is not just going to affect the longshore workers. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect the whole city the whole county and all of the surrounding counties, you know, that depend on cargo deliveries and depend on the port uh, for, you know, basic human needs, uh, pretty much. And and we've gotten to the point the the, the port has worked in a way uh, for so long that people are now used to it. And, you know, the importance of the port is not being looked at, you know, so you, you, you know, you would hate to get to the point where, you know, where people would have to feel it before they understand what's going on. So we're, we're actually being proactive and standing up against this. Uh, we're, we're, we're not just standing up for our jobs. We're actually standing up for the people 
you know, and some people don't understand that, and but a lot of people do. And, you know, that's why SLAP has been so successful. Because even the, the, the Oakland teachers, who I want to send a shout out to, um, the Oakland teachers are, are the bomb. <laughs> And uh, their their fight against the closures of those schools is a fight for the people. It's not just a fight for their jobs, or it's not just a fight for the city. It's a fight for the people, and it's a fight for the people all across this country to show that we don't have to sit here and just uh, you know sit on the sidelines while the the very rich and wealthy take more and more and more and displace our our. Uh, our comrades, you know, we, we, we just can't sit back and let that happen. So hopefully uh, that BCDC vote goes the right way. Um, there are currently uh, still some lawsuits um, that uh, the proponents of this stadium uh, are gonna have to deal with and are still dealing with right now. Um, so we're hoping that those prevail um, and um, we're just optimistic that you know, we're just, we're just, uh, Doug is chiming in. Doug? Oh, I think we don't get lots of phone calls. They're hacking our system. <laughs> That's okay. We're trend is rolling. So Doug says we're being sabotaged, but the show must go on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn my phone down. I like I got internet on the phone. Okay. That sounds good. Trent, um, you know, we have new listeners every week. I know we've talked about this before. Our new listeners are those who aren't familiar with our port and what the plans are um, that for Howard Terminal, uh, what Doug calls the Disneyland that they're trying to build uh, at Howard Terminal. Can you let our new listeners know what those plans are? Okay, well, the, the, the plans at Howard Terminal um, just to simplify it, mm -hmm. is a land deal disguised as a stadium deal. Okay. So basically the plans for Howard Terminal and the current site where the Oakland A Stadium uh, sits right now is to build high price, multi-million dollar condominiums for the rich. That's it in a nutshell. Okay. In order to get this done, because they knew that the people of Oakland would never be in support of selling off public land for cheap to a billionaire to build high priced uh, multi-million dollar condos. So the stadium was thrown in there. And the reason you know that this is what is happening is because it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have a stadium there. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. The, the infrastructure plans that are being put forth by some of those on the city council, Mayor Libby Shaft, and all of the proponents for this new so-called tax district uh, in West Oakland is a pathway to build an area for the rich and displace the poor people that need the public resources down there right now that's that's what this is okay so when you talk about building a baseball stadium and you have a current baseball stadium in place right now in the most perfect place in america to have a baseball stadium right next to the freeway connected to the bart mm -hmm. plenty of parking there, anybody who's been to the Oakland Coliseum, whether it's been for a Raider game, for a Warrior game, or for an A's game, know that the accessibility at the current Coliseum's place is one of the best in the country. That's already been determined. That's already been proven. It's already been said. Why would you then want to take away all of that perfect access, come downtown, um, not even downtown, but to the waterfront, where there's no parking, None. No access, no nothing. The rail track, the train, everything's in the way. You got truckers trying to deliver cargo. I mean, it it it, it would be a complete nightmare to to build a stadium and have baseball games down on the waterfront. Okay, because it's not about the baseball stadium. 
okay? The infrastructure work that the, the uh, city uh, council is considering is slated to cost close to a billion dollars. Wow. So you have a billionaire who wants to come in here and build condos and he wants the citizens to pay for the access to those condos <laughs> instead of doing paying for it himself. Okay. So not only are we are we going to be gentrified and and lose access um, to this land, this new tax base for who is this new tax base for? You know, who who will this benefit? Who's who does the proponents of this project plan think going to move down there? Not me, not you. OK, not not those students that they that they're displacing out of those schools, not those teachers. You know why? Because none of us can or will be able to afford to live down there. OK, that's a new tax district for the rich, which is gentrification. OK, it's it's only thing we're doing is pulling the wool from over people's eyes so they can see what this really is. It's it's a land grab. It's gentrification for billionaire to further uh, gentrify Oakland, California, okay? and to push black and brown people and disadvantaged people out so that a billionaire has access to the revenue in that area. Okay? Now, when the, when the property wasn't worth as much as it, it is now, you didn't hear any talk about no Howard Terminal Stadium and no uh, 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 high priced million dollar condos. You didn't hear anything about that when the when the property value wasn't up to par. But now that the property's worth millions and millions of dollars, instead of the community taking advantage and getting benefit, benefiting from the, the raise in the property value, now it's time to sell it off to a billionaire. That's gentrification. And it's happening all over the United States. Okay. And the only thing that's going to stop it is a collective of working people getting together and influencing uh, politics in and out of the labor movement. Audience, as you can see, this show is so powerful that they're trying to break us up even on the show here. <laughs> they could, they tried to, they tried to cut me out. I slid back in. I'm working on my cell phone because the internet. Uh, that has not ever uh, gone out, has gone out here at the office. So now I'm on my phone. Uh, Mr. Willis, Dr. Ashley, this has been one eye-opening show. Mm -hmm. And we're working with 13 minutes or less, and I have a ton of questions, but I'm going to try to pick the ones that are most important right now. Mm -hmm. Trent, as we know, Across this nation, the International Longshore and Warehouse members are some of the highest paid, if not the highest paid, in the country. I have noticed that the Alameda Labor County, what you said earlier, is trying to pit your union against the other union saying that your union is putting the other unions down. Can you clear up, because you've already cleared it up with me numerous times, can you clear up for our audience what your position is as it relates to the other union and your union because the Alameda Labor Council is saying that that ILW is putting the other unions down. And that is not the case. Can you clear that up? So when someone asks me, why is ILW picking on the other unit? You can, I can say, look at the show. Thank you. Right. Well, I actually, I, I, th this is the first time I've kind of heard it put like that. Um, I, I don't recall the labor council as a whole um, expressing that the ILWU was picking on any unions. Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> so just, just to 
explain it in simple forms to your audience, right? You've seen the movie The Godfather, okay? And you got all of the families, the the uh, the crime families, right? Not to compare labor unions to crime families, <laughs> you know. That's not. I'm not doing that that kind of comparison, but I'm just giving your audience an example. So you remember a scene in The Godfather where the other family started to mount up against this one family over here, okay? That's what seems to be happening in the Bay Area with the labor councils. Because now what we're seeing, we're having difficulties dealing with the uh, uh, Port Commission, who, um, and I said on, on previous shows that I've been on, uh, where I explained to your audience that the, the Port Commission is is doing business and, and uh, um, you know, attempting to lease land to uh, companies who want to, uh, you know, do shipping business uh, in the port that are not uh, companies that are in our uh, employer group. And then those companies are trying to negotiate contracts with other unions which um, is pitting us against other unions. You know, the IOWU is smart enough to know that it's not really about the unions and their rank and file, but more about some of these unions leadership. I'll give you one example of what I'm talking about. Um, I was on your show, um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I talked about how we all, uh, we all organized and gathered in front of the Port Commission building on one occasion um, where we shut down the port and, and gathered there and we came to the port commission to uh, demonstrate and to speak out against uh, a company called Eagle Rock coming to town and they wanted to, they want to start an aggregate operation at birth 22. Um, aggregate is like sand and gravel and uh, basically building material products, cement, stuff like that, that, that gets shipped here, um, you know, to be delivered to construction sites, things like that, you know, dump trucks and that kind of thing. Um, well, this company wanted to come to town and dictate uh, who was going to work there, you know, because they're not a member of our employer group. They're not a member of the Pacific Maritime Association employer group. So they informed us that they had plans to uh, negotiate a contract and hire the Teamsters to work on the waterfront. Okay, so I don't know how long you've been in Oakland um, or in the Bay Area, but I've been here my whole life. And that's unheard of for any other union to be loading and unloading ships other than the ILWU. You know, so that was outrageous and it outraged our members. Um, the good news about it is that after we protested and, and went and made our voices heard uh, at the Port Commission, um, we were then, uh, uh, the company decided to come talk to us about, uh, you know, hiring longshoremen on, the, on this work site, which we're still in, in talks with this company as far as, uh, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to perform these jobs. But that's just one example of what I'm talking about. You have these satellite yards popping up all over the waterfront where they have uh, non-union workers. Uh, stacking containers and, and doing work that is traditionally done by the ILWU and they're hiding behind, well, this company's not in the employer network. Well, you know, that doesn't mean much to the ILWU members. We don't care what company it is that comes down to the waterfront to move containers and move cargo. What we consider that to be our scope of work, our jurisdiction, it has been for hundreds of years and you know I, I, our membership doesn't understand uh any other in, in particular union uh coming down and infringing on uh, uh the work that the iowu does on the waterfront so this is causing a lot of tension um, a lot of it is being driven uh, by some of the leadership uh, from the labor councils Okay. And um, and I'm just going to be clear, that's another purpose of SLAP, because we know 
that the rank and file members of these unions are not supporting this. Okay. You have leader to some of the leadership of these unions are driving this to happen because they're not listening to their rank and file. So SLAP is organizing the rank and file members um, to, to organize and, and to, to uh, provide a fight back for just that type of situation. Dr. Ashley, we're working with less than four minutes. Can you ask um, <clears throat> if, if I'm going to close it out because I know our backstage uh, chief officer, mm -hmm. Mr. Willis, the information you gave on this show today was invaluable. Even though they tried to divide and conquer us today, cut me out, but you two kept the ball rolling, informing our audience from coast to coast from Mexico to Canada and in several other countries. Audience, join SLAP today. Schools and labor against privatization. Mr. Willis, we've enjoyed having you on the show today. Trent, my brother, my friend, and my colleague. We will have you back to continuously keep us informed and we're going to be recruiting uh, new members for your organization right here on the Black Business Roundtable. Thank you so much for joining our show today, Trent Willis, friend of the show. We appreciate you. All right. Thank you for having me once again to your audience. That's slapbayarea.org um, is the website. Um, we're, we're, we're looking to, to organize working people in the spirit of Martin Luther King and the, and the Poor People's March that he never had a chance to uh, to pull off because he was assassinated. We're also organizing um, and, and doing this in the spirit of the 2004 Million Worker March uh, on Washington, D.C., which you can look and Google that and you'll see what we're about. We want to organize all across the country. We want to start influencing uh, elections. We want, to, we want to start influencing uh, 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 high labor positions, and we want to add a progressive voice in this country for the working class. Uh, and that's all the whole working class, whether you be white, black, brown, yellow, doesn't matter, LGBTQ, uh, uh, Muslim, uh, Catholic, we don't care. The working class consists of, of, of all different kinds of people and it's time that we united and fought back and for the for the big take back. <laughs> the, the big payback. Da, da, da. Well, we, got to, we got to get some theme music for that. <laughs> Audience, as we wrap up today, we also continue to ask for your social media support and share these hashtags. Hashtag Stop School Bullying Crane County, Texas. Hashtag driving while black, Michael Thrash in Taylor, Texas. And when I say Texas, that's TX, Texas. Attach our podcast link from October 14th, 2021, listed once again in today's podcast description. For Michael Thrash's story, take action on social media, click the hashtag, and tag us too. Audience, as we wrap up today, I want to thank Dr. Mr. Donnie Glover, uh, Glover of Black USA, The Morning Show, Donnie Glover Show, sh Shared Space, Frontline News, Troy Rawlings Show, The Beverly Smith Show, and stay tuned as new shows are added. In addition, we are now seven days a week. Once again, Black USA. We are seven days a week. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ashley Coleman for her return back. We want to thank Janani Ramachandran, our human rights fighter, and our friend of the show. And now, SLAP representative, <laughs> Mr. Trent Willis. Trent, thank you for joining the show. Audience, this man and his organization need our support. 
And that's what you will get from the Black Business Roundtable. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. And remember, together, we can listen, we can learn, and we can share, because I know you care. This is Doug Blackshear and Dr. Ashley Coleman of the Black Business Roundtable. God bless. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll see you next week. Good night.